That's really good. For slight congestion, this is a tangy, uh, what is it? Um, ocean spray cranberry juice. So if you see me kind of glandular, kind of wake up a little bit from sipping that, do you know what's going on? We've been doing a series called The Truth About. Has it been good? Have you enjoyed it? Have you learned anything? I'm sure you have. Amen. What's so neat about the word of God is that God looks at our hearts and he sees that we are really interested in understanding the way he does things. The Bible tells us that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that everything that we have need of will be added unto us. In other words, if we get our attention off of ourselves, off of the world, off of what we're doing, and put them on the Lord and let him be our shepherd. What's that say in Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Wow, praise God. So good morning to you, church. You are God's blessed people. Say this with me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? God supplies all of my need. According to his riches in glory. Therefore God will fill me. God will bless me. And God will guide me. In these end times. So my joy will be full. And my witness will be good. Amen. That's who you are. All right, so welcome to this morning's briefing. We as children of God know God is perfect. Do you know God is perfect? That will help you understand the scripture. God is perfect. Scripture says in James that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, which is above, from the Father of lights. Amen. All right, so we found out that God is not only perfect, but he is perfect when concerning you and I. So a lot of this bad teaching, oh, you never know what God's going to do. He's guiding you through the mud and going through the flood and you all have a little bit of the crud. No, no, no. The only thing you need to be concerned about is that your body, your flesh doesn't hinder your growth. Say amen, somebody. All right, because you are your worst enemy when you don't put your body on the altar and let Jesus run the spirit and the soul of your life. All right, moving right along. So, knowing that he's perfect and dealing with us in perfection. Now, that we are born again, we have a package that God has put in us. We studied that we are complete in him. Amen. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when we accept God, we've got the goods. And then the goods inside of us are all things that pertain to life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 2. And all things that work together for good are working together. Even though our outward man perish, inwardly where God lives in our spirit and influences our soul, we are being renewed day by day. I wonder if Moses felt like that. Oh, I'm 80 years old. How oh, can God use me? Spirit of God just got him right up, didn't it? How much can you believe for? Do you believe it? Oh, it's all over. It's the end times. Or do you believe this is the most exciting time to be alive? God keeps telling me this is a time where he's going to show himself strong through his people like never before. We talk about, and you might not be an old time Pentecostal, but I was an old time raised in Pentecostal. And they had some old terminologies that maybe you heard, but you don't understand. The former and the latter rain. You ever heard that terminology? The former rain and the latter rain. The former rain is when the church was born. The latter rain is when the church goes home. Amen. Amen. And the former rain will set the church up, but the latter rain will get all people ready for the harvest. Can you say amen? God is getting you and I ready for these times. He's, he's strengthening us, getting us to refocus our life. We can't live like we lived a few years ago, wandering from church to church and going to church if we feel like it. So today's lesson is God placing us 
in his body, not you plunking yourself in whatever you want to do. Now, everybody look at me. I, I'm not going to try to pick on you, but listen. Did not we make Jesus Lord of our life? Let me see the hands of you that they made Jesus the Lord of your life. When Jesus is Lord, that means you go to him and ask him what he have you to do. And that's the problem. Now, God doesn't want to control our life and he doesn't want to, uh, you know, cause us not to think so we're so dependent. But God wants us to depend on him in such a way that we get guidance and wisdom so that when we live our life, we know we're living it with him and through him. That's the difference. Hello? So God builds his church. What did he say? He said, Peter, upon this rock will I build my church. He wasn't saying Peter. But he's saying the fact that the Father has revealed to you that Jesus is the Messiah. Upon Jesus being the Messiah in your life, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So folks, Jesus is coming back for a church without spot a wrinkle. And a lot of people go, my word, you look at the church today, it looks like I've been dragged through an auto backwards. You, you don't understand, you see. He's not coming back from a fleshy church. You're not going to bring your flesh. It's not going to heaven. Don't you know that yet, young Christian? The very thing that gives you the biggest heartache, yourself, is not going to heaven in the flesh. You're going to heaven and your soul and your spirit and your body's going to be remade in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So Christians got to get beyond yourself and realize you're not taking that old tar billy home with you. Thank, you. thank God. The one that cries out, aches, moans, and complains. The one that wants its own way. Thank God. <laughs> We're not taking that home with us. Now, let's move right on here. So if God builds his church, then he must put us in where, or excuse me, put us in the body where he sees fit to put us. If you can't teach, then you're not going to be a teacher. But if you can serve, you're going to be a servant. God is very wise. One way uh, my pastor shared with this is, now don't, you got to laugh a little bit, so just bear with me. So God is the chiefest of Jews. And, and he said to me, he says, you, I've never met a Jewish person that was poor or didn't know about business. Hello? Now, let's take that and move it up into the God's realm. God doesn't waste his time. God doesn't put you somewhere. He doesn't want you. Nothing that God does for you is lacking anything. The key is that we have to be very adept at listening to him and paying attention so he can build our life. For it is God who builds the church, not the pastor. <laughs> Aren't you glad? It's God that builds the church, not the evangelist. All right, so let's look at this thing a little deeper. This is really good. Now, I'm convinced that if somebody gets saved at a church, they ought to pray about that church and see if they're supposed to be at that church. Hello. But, oh, no, sometimes we want to go to... Now, listen to me carefully. I'm going to kind of meddle. Folks, the Bible says as many as led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Say amen. amen. Not by led by your children because you need a good children's church. Not be led by your husband, as many as are led by their husband or led by their wife. No. You see, we want to find that just right place. Folks, you go where God plants you because it will either be that right place or it will become that right place because now the last member that God wants there is you and you keep resisting coming. How is God going to build his church if the bricks keep doing their own thing? Yeah, it's kind of funny. 
But see, the church that God's building, gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Now, now listen to me. This is, I'm a thinker and I like to analyze. So that means in the areas of my life that it seems like the enemy is prevailing against, maybe it's some area that I don't need to be involved in. Hello? Because the only thing that Satan can put an arrow in is our flesh outside of God. Folks, we're in Christ. Hidden in God. That means the devil has to knock on the door to get to you. And that is unless you went outside when God said, hey, stay with me. Sheep, we got to stay in the pen until the shepherd goes out and leads us. Amen? This is a pen. The church, a local church building. You are the church. But the local church building is a pen that houses the sheep. And if the sheep never gets into the pen to get the nurturing of the shepherd, you're not going to grow in a very balanced way. You're going to become like so many in the Northwest. And they don't sit under a shepherd. They don't go to a local church. They sort of drift around and go by the goosebumpies. To me, that is just foolishness. God says you have to get to a local church, submit one to another, and be accountable in the, in the presence of God. That's what the scripture says. Now, folks, you don't have a higher revelation than what the Bible says. I don't. Went to a Bible study when I was a kid one time, very young. I was doing a youth group up in Renton. And I went to this little Bible study that these kids were going to. It was really supposedly good. But I wanted to check it out. I always checked out what my youth were doing. And so um, I checked it out. And boy, the place was packed full of kids and everything. And I thought, this is cool. And the, the lady gets up. She's a stately lady. And, you know, and she gets up. And she's got her Bible in hand. She walks in, sits down. She says, let me show you everything. She slams her Bible shut, throws it on the floor, says, we're beyond this. I'm going to show you things that are beyond the Bible. And I, I just, she started to go through it. I'm thinking, what about the souls of these children? And so from that day forward, I always pray, God, let me not share anything that's going to cause another person to stumble or cause them to believe in a way. You see, anytime there's a preaching or a teaching, the Bible says in the book of James that we have a greater judgment. We have to suffer greater appeal. In other words, God looks at us because we are influencing people and we should be influencing the proper way, the gospel way. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on. So I looked at her and I says, lady, you're out of order. Well, it wasn't two weeks later and the whole Bible study, you know, went boom. We have to build on the word. We have to build on the word. Take your life and line it up with the word of God. How you doing on that? If you haven't quite lined up yet, don't panic. Ask God to help you line up. But see, people aren't building their life around the word. They're building the word around their life. And they're wandering around, doing all kinds of goofy things, picking scriptures from left to right to justify what they're doing that's unscriptural. Let's move right on past that. So, first scripture I want to give you, okay, is 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. So, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Now, while you're going there, let me lay out a couple more things. How many know that the very rock that we build our life on is Jesus? Amen. How many here know that it says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone? Doesn't it say that? And, and of course, we have Terry over here. He's a builder. A chief cornerstone is what all the other bricks were molded and shaped off of. Off that cornerstone. The model. All the rest of the bricks were all shaped and, and modeled after that particular brick. That's what a cornerstone is, the main stone to, for the design of the building. Jesus is our cornerstone. Did you know you're quite stony too? Wait a minute. No, I'm not referring to that. Because the Bible calls us living stones. 
So let's go. First Peter chapter 2. Look at this. Okay. Who are we supposed to come to when we're weary and laden? We come to me, he said. All you that are burdened on it. So listen to this next phrase. Verse 4. Coming to him as a living stone. See, you're a stoner. No, sorry. You're a living stone. In other words, you're supposed to, your life is supposed to be a brick. That was a pun. Sorry, I don't mean to make light of that. But. It says, coming to him as living stones, rejected indeed by men. And it's talking about Jesus was in, rejected indeed by men. But God had chosen him. And he's precious. Verse 5. You also as living stones are being built up. What are we being built? That means coming to church on a regular basis, God's building you. Well, what happens if you don't come regularly? He can't do much with you. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to come to church so God can build the work up. Can you say amen? When your brick is not here, part of the church is missing. When your light isn't here, part of the church is dark. Bible says as we see the day approaching, Hebrews 10, 25, we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together unto him. Amen. And yet today, we see everybody doing their own thing. Skipping church and doing, and now of course I'm not, I'm a pastor. My greatest hope is to see every spot filled. People hungering, sitting on the front pew, just desiring to have the word. And you know, that's who God's looking for. Isaiah 66, verse 3. Whom does the Lord look? To those of a contrite spirit, those that tremble at God's word. Psalms 119 is an entire chapter, the largest one in the Bible, all about the word of God and building your life about the word. Catch this. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Why? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our job when we gather is to give glory to God. And what happens in the spirit when a church starts giving glory to God? There's a fire that comes down. There's a glory. There's light to come down. It acts like a great big huge black hole. And sucks everything into it. Except for it's a light hole. But see, today the church comes to church when they want to come to church. And they're sort of more goatish than they are sheepish. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody. You know, a goat butts and makes excuses while a sheep will simply follow. Say, I'm sheep. You're sheep. Amen. Let the shepherd guide your life instead of you. All right, so here's a couple of things I want to remind you of. Our job is to bring sacrifices of praise to God, right? So, what did you do yesterday? You brought sacrifices of praises. What did you do the day before? You brought sacrifices of praises. Your whole life is a testimony and a praise to God. Did you know when you get up, Satan goes, oh no. I wish they would just die and get out of here. That's how Satan looks at us. But we get up, we rejoice. And man, we just singe him and burn him every time we praise the Lord. Man, burn him. That's just a little reminder where he's going to end up. In hell. Couple points underneath that scripture. Number one, when a Christian gives their life to Christ, God wants to put them in a place where they can hear the word and be trained. Do you agree with that? God designed the local church to be a training center for a believer to become equipped. Second of all, no one knows better than God himself where to place you and I. Especially where to be trained. Why do we fight it so hard? Well, it's not the church that I would hope it would be. How about the one God wants you to be in? See, we never put the God 
put our God first and the way he wants to choose for us. And and then we wonder why our life's not going so good. Your life is made up of all your choices. Let's make the right ones. No one knows better than God where to put you. And thirdly, Christians believe it. We are designed to walk and to be with God. Do you believe that? God's design has never changed. But because of sin and stuff, he couldn't walk and talk with us until Jesus came. Now that Jesus came, and we have him in our heart, there's an invisible kingdom that's like a garden that you and I walk in, in the same time we're walking in the shadow of death, the world. So we walk in two places at once. We walk in the world, but we walk into a spiritual equipped kingdom that we have access and we have entrance to, and we are children of the king. So you have to get up every morning and decide what kingdom you're going to be operating in. If you're going to be operating in your physical kingdom, are you going to be operating in your spiritual thankfulness to offer up praises because you're already set, you already have your ticket, their seat is saved, and you're on your way. Satan would like to convince you, though, you don't have a ticket, you don't have a place. But you just got to laugh. Whenever the devil tells you you're a turkey, you got to laugh. Because he's a what? He's a liar. And liars, you can believe the opposite. Kind of sounds like a little bit of a politics nowadays, huh? That's about all I'm going to say there. So, Christians believe it. We're designed to walk with God. Just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. So you can either do that every day or you could just get cumbered up with the world in all its ways. And believe me, right now, that wouldn't be a very good place to be. Amen. Next scriptures, Ephesians chapter 5, please. Verse 15 through 22. Now this is an instruction that Paul is giving to the Christians. Now, can you listen to this? Can you believe that a Christian can get to a place where things are going so well, they think it's unnormal. It's not normal for things to go good like that. Did you know I had a day, a a brother came to me and he said, I want you to ride along with me in my business because I've been asking God to give me a perfect day. And God says to have you come along. Now this is his words, not mine. So we did. The whole day just fit. Two people got saved. This was a business route. They came out and said, I want to get saved. It was just like they fell into our hands. You see, when we delight in the Lord, it says that he will bring it to pass. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, we're like children. You think God's going to let a bear come on into the midst of the kingdom of God and eat you up? Because you're frolicking and you're enjoying God? Absolutely not. The reason why you feel those feelings is Satan doesn't want you to do that. Because the moment you start doing that, revival breaks out. And to stay doing that for a period of time, it's going to affect thousands of people. How do you think every revival ever broke out in this world? Is when people got their eyes off of everything else except for God and listened to what God said and they stayed with it long enough. So God was developed and they created a white hole and sucked everything in. And let me just give you one. The Azusa Street Revival. Yeah. Read about it. Yeah. They started off less than this for years and years. Didn't see anything. Until all of a sudden, crack and boom. And then we have all kinds of institutions and ministries because of that revival. We have the Church of God of Prophecy, the Church of God. We have the Assemblies of God. We have the uh, United Pentecostal Church. All those came out of Azusa Street. How does a work like that happen? When we get our eyes off of ourselves. When we get our eyes off of everybody else. Stop criticizing and start obeying. And God will literally cause you to win souls just like it is walking. It will be so easy when we do it God's way. God said whatever is born of God 
overcometh the world. He didn't say whoever. He said whatever. That means your visions, your church. Gates of hell cannot prevail against you because you have almighty God living on the inside of you. Do you walk like that? Do you talk like that? Not prideful. Confident, humble, and not afraid. Confident, humble, and not afraid. Okay, listen to this. See that you walk, this is verse 15. See that you walk circumspectly or uprightly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming or buying back the time because the days are evil. Verse 17 says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Everyone, say what the will of the Lord is. He's about to tell us what the will of the Lord is. So this thing that he's about to tell us is something you can do every day that will com completely transform you and completely bless God and make him happier than all happy can be. Just if you'll practice this one thing right here. So he says, when well, this is the will of God, what is it? The will of God. Amen. Come on, folks. Shake yourself a little. This, when you do this, Becky, you do the will of God every time. Listen. Don't be unwise. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in its dispensation. In other words, you might tip a little bit. You might do these things. But God says, don't get drunk in the world. Don't get caught up in the world's way. It will cause you to be intoxicated and insensitive for what the Spirit of God is saying. You can get drunk on food. Some people can't stop eating. You're being intoxicated by some kind of temptation. Don't be that way. So he says, be not drunk with wine. We're in dispensation, but be filled with the spirit. What did it be? We're to be what? Filled Speaking to yourselves or one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Hey, Denise, God's got a little song for you. Hey, Be Becky. God's got a I love you song. You see, a joy, a song in our heart. Making melody. God wants us to be doing that. Why? Because then we're ready at any moment. Hello? Moving right along. Okay. But be filled with the Spirit and singing to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things. You know, people read extra stuff in there. They say, giving all thanks to God for everything that comes your way. That's not what it says. It says, give thanks unto God for what? Look at what it says. It says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't say for everything. What do you have in you? You have all things to pertain to life and godliness, Denise. Amen. So guess what? When you're singing and you're rejoicing and being caught up in God, that's working together for your good. That's putting you over. That's transforming you. You're becoming more like a butterfly than a big old bump sitting in a tree in some kind of cocoon. Amen. I think a lot of cocoons go to church. It's time you bust loose. A couple of things I want to bring up to you. Now we know it's the will of God for us to rejoice, to sing, and to be in church. Hello? I see a whole bunch of people that are not in church. Oh, we went there. Did God want you to go there? See, this is what people don't. They, they, it's okay to talk about God, but don't get too close to my personal. Me personally, because I, I resent being on the spot and well, let me tell you, it's best to do it God's way all the time. It's not good to do it your way, even if you think it's right. Because you'll find out soon enough, it's not. 
Amen. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It's talking about doing your own thing without bringing God in on it. All right, let's go to my next point. My next point is the church that God builds. We are the church that God builds. There's only one church. Everyone say one church worldwide. Amen. Not billions of churches, okay, but one church. And the one church is built on who? Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a lot of people that are having churches and having works, and I'm not picking on any of them. But it's only the works that we build in Jesus Christ that last. So guess what? I don't have to be concerned if they're doing it right or doing it wrong. God will all take care of that. My job is to make sure I'm doing it right and not doing it wrong. My job is not to criticize people down the street or somebody you don't like on TV. That's foolishness. Your job is to look at you and keep yourself lined up with the scripture and rejoice all the time and get caught up in God. Why? Because it just throws the devil into a tizzy. He has no longer any control over you. You are out of control in his world and you're winning people to the Lord and he can't stop you. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Say amen. When you do it God's way. When you let God kind of put you where he wants you. I love it. Okay, go with me to this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 through 14. The church that God builds. For as many... Excuse me, for as the body is one, one unit, and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many different kinds, are one body. How many bodies are there? Why do people get so upset when you tell them you go to the first church of God? And then you go to this church up here. What difference does it make if you love God? But if you're going to that church just because your mom told you to, that would be the wrong reason. You're going to that church because you don't know why it's convenient. You can walk to it. That, that's no reason to go to a church. You go to the church that God plants you in. And you stay at that church until he's done with you. And enjoy it. We call it bloom where you plant it. And you know the way things are looking... Is it's very few are, are meeting at churches. And you never thought that would really be. We talked about it for years. Oh, there'll be a time where you'll be persecuted and won't be allowed to go to church. And they'll be telling you to stay at home and don't get too excited. And, huh? and we said all those for years. Now look at For as a body is one, has many members, each member is of that one same body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for one, by, listen to this, by one spirit, we were all baptized or immersed into one body. So who did that? When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, who puts you into the body of Christ? The Holy Spirit does. And he makes you an arm, an eye, an ear. He makes you a teacher, a preacher. He makes you an usher. He's the one that makes you who you are. Can you say amen? You don't make yourself that way. You simply obey to become that way. You don't make yourself that way. You simply obey to become that way. All right. So it goes on. Now, this is the king. How many know that Satan feeds on arguing and turning people against each other, huh? In the last days, it should be kingdom will rise up against kingdom and nation against nation, right? Well, see, what you don't know about kingdom, about kingdom, it also means color. Black against the whites and the whites against the Chinese and the Chinese again. Excuse me if I use Chinese or anything. The idea is Satan does that to get us to mistrust one another. Get us to put our guard down and he comes in and you get 
you. So Paul preached, there's neither a Jew nor a Gentile. There's neither a bond, a slave, or a free. There's neither a male nor a female. Now, is he talking about the flesh? No, he's talking about in the spirit. Because you can tell who's male and who's female. Who's black and who's white. But he's saying in the realm of God's kingdom, there's no separation. In fact, people who cause separation, like you're white and you worship that way. And I'm black and I worship this way. God marks you and says you cause division and he pushes you out. Because you cause strife. God doesn't want us divided. Black people have red blood. White people have red blood. Japanese people have red blood. Chinese people have red blood. African people have red Spanish people have what? <sighs> There's none of that now. If we're serving God, you don't look at the outward man. Paul says, I look at no man after the flesh. I look into their hearts. I look into their spirit. Yeah. And that's how God looks at us. Yeah. Remember, God shows David. Remember Jesse, the pro, you know, Jesse's kids, right? And the prophet came and he saw the first son. He said, wow, let's anoint that guy. You know, this is like the church. Let's anoint who looks good, has the most money, you know. And he went all through the kids and there was nobody. And he says, do you have anybody else? Oh, yeah, there's David. You know, but what was David doing? He was around the sheep. He was learning how to take care of things. Some of the things that I used to do with my leaders and elders is give them a plant and say, take care of it. If it died, then we know that they need some real training on how to take care of things. You can't be in the ministry and you don't know how to take care of things like your home, your family, huh? your businesses. Your life. So we are all wise because we realized. We take this whole ball of goodies. We place ourselves in God's hands and we, God, deal with this mess. I'll simply obey you and follow you out. Didn't God say the shepherd will go before them and he will lead them out? Amen. Hold on to Jesus' robes. He's guiding you out of yourself. Oh, hurry up, Jesus. Amen. Let's go on. So, it says the body is one body. So, stop talking about denominational bodies. Talk about those who are in love with God and those that need to really be more in love with God. Why? Because there's no Jews, no Gentiles. There's no Greeks, no bonds, no servants, no male, no female. And there is no black or white, Spanish. Japanese, Chinese, it says we're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I, wow, wouldn't that, that would just destroy any kind of prejudice. Isn't God the destroyer of prejudice? You know, the only time I ever noticed anything about being, what was it, um, what was it called? Being racist, this is the terminology. So I had years and years ago, some people come out, they were Bikers, they rode bikes. And they made this comment because they thought everybody who was in leadership and everybody who was in government were all a bunch of phonies. So they thought I was a phony too. And they says, don't you seem like you're being just a little hypocritical, Pastor, and, and making a parking space for us people to have bikes? Aren't you being a racist about that? And he says, it's funny because the only time I ever see anybody bringing up race is, and that kind of thing are the ones that are the racists. To me, I, I don't even think about it. Because there's no black, no white, no red, no blue. No male, no female. I treat you one and God treats us all as one. He's no respecter of persons. So all you other knuckleheads, stop doing that. You'll end up where you don't want to end up. All right, a couple of points I want to give you. Say amen, somebody. I'm not boring you, am I? Okay, a couple of points. God puts each of us into his body as it pleases him. Too many Christians are not settled 
into a work of God, but instead wandering about like a plant without roots. Folks, we all need to help somebody get planted. I don't believe that this is the only church. There's millions of churches, good ones. But find one. Can you say amen? Make sure it's the one God wants you in. All right. Another thing is once we allow God to place us wherever he wants to place us, hook up and learn the ropes of that new life. Thirdly, many today suffer from not being a part of a work of God. They have no roots. I've, I've ran into thousands of them. And they just can't submit to a local pastor. They just can't quite get to a place because they're free. And they, they worship and that special. I got news for that. That's a bunch of pokiness. The Bible says if you're truly a man or woman of God, you've got to learn to submit to God and to others who might love you. If you can't even do that, then how's God going to have you do anything if you can't submit to his instructions? Say, oh me, somebody. Okay, so if he puts us where it pleases him, then we should just stay in that place to please him. Once we allow God to place us somewhere, know the ropes. And thirdly, many today suffer from being not part of a work of God. And so they say, well, where do you go to church? And they have no real answer. Or they'll make one up. See, I'm friends with a lot of the pastors in the area. And, if, and we have a little thing that we do. And I know you might not want to hear it. But when we get a group of people come in and they destroy churches and they cause messes... They're labeled, like the Bible says, and then the next place they go, the pastor's called, and they're warned. So that we can get these people that are destroying the work of God, which says God will destroy them if they keep it up. He does, 1 Corinthians 6. We warn each other, and we, we try to put each other. Why? Because as far as I'm concerned as a pastor, I value you. You're the most valuable thing to God. And how I take care of you and how I share with you is very important. So I want to give you my best. Can you say amen? And I know you're the same way. When you're sharing or teaching your children or doing that, you want to give your best. And if you make a mistake, apologize. It's, it's no big deal. Because this side of heaven, we need Jesus. All right, let me give you a scripture. God wills to put you and I in his body and he made you and I fit into a local church. So stop plucking yourself up and going wherever you want to go. You ever transplanted a plant any length of time more than twice, three times, you'll kill the plant. You'll shut the growth down and they'll never develop. God doesn't want you traveling around with itchy ears, listening to whoever's going to tickle your fancy and, and pet your kids. No, he wants you into a church where you're going to be trained. God will raise up somebody to train the kids. See, in this church, I don't preach over anybody's head. Kids get as much here as adults do. Because the Holy Spirit fits it all for them. Can you say amen? And if you don't believe me, just sit there long enough and do nothing. And then the Holy Spirit will read your mail and you'll think that I'm picking on you. That's how good the Holy Spirit is here. Because he knows not to leave you in the condition in the briar bush somewhere. Hey, you're in the briar bush. Leave me alone. You're picking on me. Go ahead and thrash about some more. Do you like all the bleeding and ripping of your flesh? No, pay attention to what I'm telling you. That's my job. All right. So, and so you wonder, I think, I think I had this teacher when I was in the sixth grade. His name was Mr. Diamond. That guy was a man that could teach. Everything he taught came alive. And that's my prayer that when I teach that you'll see clear pictures and the whole revelation of God's desire for you will come alive. And that you'll realize that a lot of this stuff that we've been experiencing is all foolishness. 
It's actually a big deception sometimes. We don't need to get so caught up in all that. We can't change it anyway, can we? We pray about it, leave it in God's hands and continue to sing psalms and hymns and rejoice, making melody in our heart to the Lord. Why? Because our tickets paid, our seats reserved. In my father's house, I prepared a mansion for you, Jesus said. Be a functioning part of the body of Christ is my next point. Be a functioning part. Romans 12, 3 through 5, listen to this. For I say through grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather to think soberly as God has given to each one a measure of faith. You got all the faith you'll ever need already inside of you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For as we have many members in the body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So what Denise does blesses us. And what Terry does blesses us. What Marvin does and all the rest of you, if I leave out a name, there's a bunch of you out there, that you do blesses us. The scripture says that each part, each part of us, each member does its share, causes growth in the body of Christ. See, if we're particularly paying attention to what our part is, and that we're just rejoicing the Lord and we're doing our part, then we don't have to worry if the pastor's doing his part. We're doing our part. And if you're doing your part, and you're doing your part, and they're doing their part, and you're praying, and you're doing your part, the church is going to explode. Whether it be a local church like this, whether it be a larger church, or whether it just be in general in the United States, the church in America. Are you with me? For as we have many members in one body, each member is a member of one another. So guess what? We're accountable to each other. Here's a couple of points. Number one, to be a part of a local church, we must be humble and willing to become a functioning part of that body. To each person is to import or impart a portion of their livelihood in the functioning of a local church. In other words, you might be an arm. I might be a leg. But together we get things done. Can you say amen? So we're important to the functioning of that local church. Thirdly, God puts us where he wants us and puts in us what he needs. Aren't you glad you don't have to do that? And fourthly, we need each other, folks. We need each other. This should be a sanctuary. People come and find refuge and find rest and find joy and find food if you need be. Fellowship. That's what a local church is all about. But we have so, been so Americanized in churches. We go to church, we get a sermon, we pass an offering, beep, 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 we can all go home. You don't hardly know anybody in the church. And if you do, you don't know if you like them or not. You know. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this says they went from house to house. They knew each other. They broke bread, had communion. And it says fear came on every soul in the neighborhood. And God added to the church such it should be saved. Amen. That's what we're doing. Can't think of anything more scriptural than what we're doing right here. Hello. All right. So we found out there's many members and all part of that one body. Now, folks, we need each other. So go with me to 1 Corinthians again in verse 12. Drop down to verse 15 through 19. Same chapter as you were. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15 through 19. We're going to stay in that chapter a little while, so don't go anywhere. Okay, so how many has ever felt that truly God has a part for you in the body of Christ? 
How many here might not know what that, I don't want you to raise your hand on this one. You might know what your part is. Maybe you don't know. It's okay. You go to God and you say, God, what's my part in the body? You see the body that you're having me go to? What am I supposed to be doing? Now listen, if you're going to a body, but all you're doing is going and listening, you're not functioning. You're just listening. It can be, I didn't say it was, but it can be dangerous just to go to a church and listen. You're supposed to be involved in ministry in some form. You're supposed to be equipped in some form of functioning where every part does its share. Hello, that's how we grow. Hey, you want to learn how to flip an egg? Come on to my kitchen. I'll, I'll show you how to flip an egg. Now you're going to mess up a few. But once, in a while, once you get that little hang and that little flip of your wrist, there you're going to get it down real good. Well, it's the same way in the spiritual realm. Let me get you to a place where you know how to flip your wrist and get those things going so your life takes on ease and you reach people and they can honestly see that you're not fighting to maintain your walk, but you are either taking your walk and you're changing people around you because God runs your life. You don't run it. Say, oh, me, somebody. And then point at somebody and say, oh, you. No, I'm you know. <laughs> You do everything I say. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just fun with you. Now, so if the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. See, this is depression. Uh, I'm not like all these other people that go to that church. They all seem to know more than me. So the foot says, I guess I'm not a hand. No. And you might be sitting there and saying, well, what's God going to do with me? You're very important. Every one of you. You should be asking God what you should be doing. Instead of wondering, how come I'm not doing this? Those that wonder, wander. Those that wonder, wander. Just look at the Israelites. God says, you're going to the other side. About every 10 miles, they'd stop and complain about something. Moving right along. So the foot can't say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. And therefore, is it not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, where would be this hearing? And if the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as it pleases him. And if they were all one member, like a foot or an ear, where would the body be? And folks, we have that problem today. People go to a certain church. They're all young and they're all this way. That's when all, they, all the feet gather to one body and all the hands are over on the other body. No, there need to be feet, arms, legs in every body. Mouthpieces, eyes, the whole thing. What's your place? What are you doing to build the church? You're here. God put you here. What are you doing? Well, I'm thinking about me. Well, don't do that. Believe it or not, I overdosed, overdosed on myself many a time, and it's no fun. So let's go on past that. What do you mean? Too much of me goes a long ways. All right. Same, same scripture. Let's go down further. Okay? And if they all were one member, okay? So my other point is, when Christ becomes our first priority, folks. We become dedicated to a local body and we begin serving others. It's just the way it is. And if you find somebody, all they wanted to go in is just have a meeting and preach and live off of everybody, raise up debts. I know that plenty of wonderful, I'm sure they're wonderful Christian people, have no root, they're not accountable to anybody, they're going around, they're mounting up debt in the name of Jesus Christ, we got some people came in rented from us, didn't pay their debt, now I released them of the debt, 
because I don't want to behold anything. But how could you walk around saying you're evangelist, you're this, you're that, and you owe everybody your shirt and your, 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 your shoes? Duh. And you want to have a meeting. Get to church, show yourself submissive. Oh, I'm afraid. What if the guy wants to control me? You'll have to take that and trust God about that. Because you're too in control of our life to settle down and let God train you. You're a goat. Goats are not bad. They just need to be guided a whole lot more than sheep. So look at somebody next to you and say, you're not a goat, are you? <laughs> Bless your hearts. Amen, I sure love you. See, we're family, so you, you know, come on. All right, so let's go down a little further. Verse 20 through 25. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20 through 25. The body works together. Every part is to do its share. Right? All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 25. But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand... I have no need of you. Now it's opposite. You notice? A foot. So I'm not a hand. So I guess I'm not of the body. Now it's opposite. Now somebody says. That's a hand. I have no need of you. No. God needs everybody. He puts everybody in the church. That he wants there. That's why you don't go to the church of your choice. You go to the church of his choice. He plants you there. And yes, you're going to go through trials. Things are not going to work out right. Is that for you to, you're in the middle of the ocean to jump off the ship? No, you stick to the course. You work out the problems together. We, we live in America. And if the machine doesn't quite do what I want, we let's throw it away and get another one. And that's what we do with our churches and with our Christians. And we wonder what God's doing up there going, oh, 2020, you know. Let's move on. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, now listen, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And these members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts, that parts which are almost ashamed of, they have greater modesty. In other words, we take care and we try to watch over our kids and those that have special needs. Are you with me? And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God has composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks, that there be no divisions in the body. But the members should have, have the same care one for another. So it doesn't matter if somebody's five or somebody's 95. We care for them the same way. We love them. See to their needs. Right? We have tithing in the church to, to help people who are in need. Somebody came and, and they don't have any food. We can give them food and we can help them maybe with some rent. So their church function is very beautiful and very God inspired. The local church is God's design when it functions properly. And to stay away from the will of God is very dangerous. Everyone say, not me. All right. Every function of every part of the body, however great, however not so great, Causes the growth of everyone in the Lord. To become a functioning family. 
We, a lot of us come from dysfunctional families. Some of us come from ones that are okay. Some of us maybe don't have a father or a mother in the scene. Maybe something was broken. But you see, God's family is not broken. Your heavenly father is your father now. Jesus is your Lord and your brother. Holy Spirit, your own, I call him Uncle Holy Ghost. You might laugh at me. Because they're your family. And we walk in their midst every day. Don't try to ignore that they're not there. Why do we continue to walk on and not address God? And yet he's omnipresent. He's always with us. And here's what happens when we don't acknowledge God throughout the day. He can't direct our path. It's like we're not plugged in. We're not hooked up. We're not listening to the right radio station. So guess how we wander off. And we go, oh gosh, how did I get over there? You turned the radio off. You turned your shepherd's voice down. Yep. Your need and your loneliness is spoken greater than Jesus. That's what the devil does. He tries to trick us. A couple more points and we're going to release you and, and let you conquer your week. Allow God to... To turn you into a living stone, not a river rock. River rocks sink to the bottom. You're a living stone. You show expression, praise. Man, I'm amazed that some of you aren't up here dancing when the worship is going on. Grabbing the flag, you know. Going beyond yourself is the key to getting to a higher plateau beyond belief beyond because belief is how you see something and if you consult the word God broadens your belief and you see better things but if we can't get you in the scripture all you're going to see is yourself in there beholding a natural man Goeth away and forget what manner of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, he will be blessed in what he does. We are in Christ Jesus, are we not? Then our very life should show it. Let's give the Lord praise. <laughs>